Thank you so much for that kind introduction. These days, it's hard not to hear about climate change, isn't it? Every time we turn on the news, we hear about how Australian wildfires are burning across the country. We hear, just a few months earlier, how wildfires in California are devastating communities there. Here in Northern Ireland, you don't have to look too far to find headlines about flooding, drought, and heat waves. As the Prime Minister of Dominica said, which was one of the small islands that was devastated during the hurricane season in 2017, he said, to deny climate change is to deny a truth that we have just lived. Yet, people do deny it all the time. In the US, where I live, we have politicians who say, for everybody who thinks it's warming, I can find somebody who thinks it isn't. From the state where I live in Texas, alarmist theories on climate science originate with scientists who operate outside the principles of the scientific method. From my home country of Canada, our former prime minister, carbon dioxide is not a pollutant, it is a naturally occurring gas that is vital to the life cycles of this planet. And if you know about carbon dioxide, you would say, yes, but. In Australia, following the wildfires, the Prime Minister said there's no credible link to climate change. And if you think you're going to get away scot-free, no. There are quotes we can find right here at home, like this one. <laughs> the Paris Agreement is a delusion, a piece of window dressing for climate chancers who wish to pretend they were doing something about an issue which they can't affect anyways. This is from a self-written statement on his website that was still there today, I checked. Now, I couldn't find poll information specifically for Northern Ireland, so take this with a grain of salt, since this is for the Republic. But a very recent poll, um, just this past year, asked people about climate change in Ireland. And they said, is climate change a serious issue? Um, a lot of people said yes, agree is green, but a lot of people said no, I disagree, that's, that's reddish. And then it asked about questions. Do you think it will be as bad as some people say? Um, should we be doing more about it? Should the government be spending more money? Most people say no. So we often think, if they just knew more facts, surely they would change their minds, right? And this is something, this is an assumption on which our entire educational system is actually based. Something called the knowledge deficit model, or I like to call it the blank slate model. It's the idea that if people don't have the right opinion about something, all we need to do is give them more information. And if we give them more information, they will change their minds. Now this does work with a lot of issues. If somebody thinks that two plus two equals five, you can give them information that it equals four and most people will change their minds. If someone doesn't know what dark matter is and you explain it to them, I'm not sure that they'll remember it, but at least they will change their minds and agree with you at least briefly. But when it comes to climate change, the knowledge deficit model fails. It's been eight years since the seminal study was published by a psychologist called Dan Cahan at Yale University. This is Dan. I like to show you the pictures of people so you know who they are. This is Dan. And in his paper, they said, he and his colleagues, public apathy over climate change is often attributed to a deficit in comprehension. People don't know enough science, it's claimed, to avoid being misled. If this is true, then what is the solution? Obviously, the solution is to write more reports. And that's what we've done. I just finished writing a 1,600-page report on climate change for the Trump administration. Do we think the 1,600 pages will change their mind? I knew it wouldn't because Dan had already done this study. Here's his conclusions. We found no support for this. Members of the public with the highest degree of science literacy was not, were not most concerned. They are the ones among whom cultural polarization is greatest. What is cultural polarization? Well, in the United States, there's a foundation called the Pew Foundation that has been tracking polarization since 1994, so the last 26 years. And these results I'm going to show you are for the U.S., but believe me, we have seen the same thing happening in Canada, Australia, and the U.K. 
Back in 1994, when they first started tracking this, the median conservative or Republican, now bear in mind here that red is associated with conservatives in the US and blue with liberals, with Democrats. It's a, the opposite in some places. Um, the median Democrat and the median Republican were closer to each other than they were to people at the fringes of their own party. And then over time, what happened? 2011, 2017, and this was an election year. So when they polled only people who actually voted in the election, Today, the median liberal and median conservative is closer to the fringes of their own party than they are to each other. What does this have to do with climate change? Pretty much everything. Because today, the number one predictor of whether we agree that climate is changing, humans are responsible, the impacts are serious, and action is needed now, is where we fall on the political spectrum. I see this in the literature, but I also see this in my own experiments that I conduct on social media. I view Twitter as a bit of an experiment. I uh, am usually attacked by trolls multiple times a day, and whenever I have to block anyone, which I only do for one reason, and that is the inability to conduct a civil conversation on social media. That is the only reason. If there's a strong correlation between climate denial and that, that's not my fault. I would say the correlation is 99.5%. <laughs> but when I have to block somebody, I don't do so lightly. I actually go to their profile. I look at who they are. I read their description of themselves. I even look at their picture if they have one. I look at the first few posts they have on their Facebook or, or Twitter page. And you know what I see? The number one commonality I see in the people who I have to block for unsolicitedly attacking me out of nowhere is their political affiliation. If they are from the US, they have M-A-G-A in their profile. If they're from the UK, what do you think they have in their profile? Brexit. If they're from Canada, they have I hate the prime minister in their profile. I mean, you have to be pretty serious to put that in your profile if you only have 160 characters. And if they come from Australia, they love the prime minister. So Dan didn't stop there. Dan Cahan went on, and he developed something called ordinary science intelligence. It was a measure of how well that we we're able to understand quantitative information like data. And he found that there was only a very weak positive correlation between how high people ranked in terms of ordinary science intelligence and whether they were able to answer this question accurately. Is there solid evidence of recent global warming caused by human activities like burning fossil fuels? But then he took the same data set and he divided it into half based on one thing. And at this point, you can probably guess what that one thing is. It was a US data set, so he asked people to tell him how they identified politically. The smarter we are, the better we are at cherry picking the information that so shows why we are already correct. And you know what, we all do this. We all do this, but when do we do it? We do it when there is an issue that is very near and dear to our hearts that we are emotionally attached to that is part of our identity. Every single one of us does it. Let me give you a very low stakes example. My husband and I are both academics. And I grew up with the idea that if there's leftovers, you eat them. You keep eating them until they're gone. In fact, often leftovers are better the next day. He grew up with the idea that old food is bad food, and you throw it out after you've done eating it. So we had a few arguments when we first got married, and peer-reviewed publications came into that argument. <laughs> Can you eat the yogurt the week before it expires, the day it expires, two days after it expires? You can find papers that argue both ways. And I was not looking for information to learn from. I was looking for information to show why I was right. See? So we resolved the argument by I eat the food and he doesn't. And I have to admit, I have eaten a few things I shouldn't have. But he hasn't eaten a few things he should have. That's a very low stakes example. But you see what I mean? It's, it was part of our identity. So we weren't looking to see who, what the right answer was. We were looking to prove that we were right. 
Now imagine when it comes to climate change, a much more powerful and emotionally attached and emotionally fraught issue, how much more do we do it there? In the United States, as of this year, climate change is now the number one most politically polarized issue in the country. This is a recent survey that just came out a few weeks ago. Let me explain what you're looking at because it's kind of complicated. The red bar indicates where conservatives would be in terms of how important they think this issue is, um, the red dot. The blue dot is where liberals are in terms of how important they think a given issue is. And the wider the gray bar between the dots, the more politically polarized the issue. So what Pew has done is they've actually ranked these issues from top to bottom based on the width of the gray bar. What do we have at the bottom? At the bottom we have issues that people agree on. Like what? Like drug addiction, crime, jobs, global trade, infrastructure. People agree on that. What do we have at the top? Issues that people disagree about. Number one is climate change and number two is environmental protection. Now again, you may say, well, that's just the US. Well, for example, surveys in the UK show that conservative MPs are five times as likely to vote against climate action. We see the same polarization around the world. We are not blank slates. So at this point, if you're an educator, if you're somebody whose entire system of communication is based on the idea that if we just tell people more information, they will change their minds, your inner monologue, like mine did when this first dawned on me, may look something like this. What are we supposed to do then? If more facts and more information don't change people's minds, how are we supposed to have this conversation? I have three steps for you. And each step has three points to it. So that's nine total, in case you're wondering. And here is step number one. Step number one may sound obvious, but it's pretty subtle, and a lot of us don't know this. Step number one is the sciency, religiousy, and even the economic -y arguments we so often hear opposing climate action are smoke screens. They are smoke screens for the real problems. And so if we focus entirely on the smoke screens, what we are doing is we are like Don Quixote tilting at windmills. We will get wrapped up in endless debates over it's real, yes it is, no it isn't. This scientist says it is, this scientist says it isn't. What about volcanoes and natural cycles? We can get wrapped up in endless discussions that can go on for years, never getting anywhere. What do these objections look like? And why are they not based on solid ground? Let's just look at a few of them so you know what I mean. What do science-y sounding objections look like? Objections that sound scientific but aren't. It's freezing outside, so where's global warming now? When we know that the average temperature of the planet, as we see in red, goes up and down from year to year, but decade by decade by decade, it is ticking steadily upwards. Weather is like a, a tree. It explains what happens in a certain place at a certain time. So it can be cold or hot, wet or dry. But climate is the long-term average of weather over at least 20 to 30 years. So saying it's cold outside so the entire planet cannot be warming over climate time scales is like, this is so appropriate, I love it, being on the Titanic and saying that my ship can't be sinking because my end just went 200 feet up in the air. Then people say, oh, but it's been warmer before. Haven't you heard of the medieval warm period when the Vikings took the cruises to Greenland? This is not an actual photograph of that time. <laughs> Surfing was invented later in Hawaii. During the medieval warm period, which is firmly ensconced into our cultural memory in both Western Europe and North America, during the medieval warm period, it was warmer than average over the North Atlantic only. Anywhere that's red is warmer than average. But because this was a natural cycle, and all natural cycles do is move heat around the climate system from east to west and north to south, because it was just a natural cycle, it had to take that heat from somewhere else. It had to rob Peter to pay Paul, so to speak. 
And if you lived in Siberia at the exact same time, it was actually the medieval cold period. But you don't hear a lot about that, do you? If you're wondering what this exact same figure looks like today, it looks like this. Yes. And then, one of my other favorite sciencey sounding arguments is, it's such a tiny amount of CO2. I mean, it's only 415 parts per million in the atmosphere. I feel like, well, it's a tiny bit of white powder I put in your drink. Surely, no. Better example, it's just a tiny pill that the doctor gave you. Shouldn't the doctor have given you a pill the size of your body? <laughs> we know it's the potency that matters, and we know that CO2 has gone up and down and up and down and up and down over time and sync with the ice ages, but we know that in recent years, CO2 has skyrocketed far higher than anything we've experienced in the history of our civilization on this planet. And then people say, okay, well, maybe you think that climate is changing and humans are responsible, but everybody knows you haven't studied it long enough to be sure. Well, actually we have. These are the real scientists. They are not, you know, when you take your family and you dress up in the old outfits and you take the black and white note. This is not one of those. These are the real photographs of the scientists in the 1800s. The French scientist Joseph Fourier, who discovered that our planet has an amazing natural blanket of heat trapping gases that keeps us 30 degrees warmer than we would be otherwise. The planet would be a frozen ball of ice if we did not have natural heat trapping gases in the atmosphere. John Tyndall in the middle was an Irish physicist from Galway. He discovered which gases make up this blanket, including water vapor and coal gas, which is what he called methane. He also linked these gases directly to human activities, specifically coal mining was producing more of them. And at the same time as Tyndale, on the opposite side of the ocean, there was a woman called Eunice Foote, who was an amateur scientist who had attended a girls' school that had one of the best chemistry labs in the country at that time. And she conducted an experiment in 1856 using glass jars in her backyard that she filled with different gases and measured how much they heated up. And she wrote a paper that was presented at the annual meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which is a meeting that I still attend today. And in that paper, she wrote, if CO2 levels were higher at any time in the Earth's past or future, our temperature would be warmer. 1856. These are the sciencey sounding arguments, but in fact, we know that if people really rejected the basic science that explains how the planet is warming, they would also have to reject refrigerators, stoves, airplanes, and almost every piece of modern technology we use because it's based on the same physics. And although you can find a website about everything, there's not a lot of websites that claim that airplanes actually do not fly. Now, I'm not going to say there isn't one because... So the science sounding arguments don't have a leg to stand on, but what about the religious sounding arguments? The idea that if God is in control, then humans can't affect the planet. We've got a lot of those types of quotes, too. This is a U.S. Senator from Oklahoma. The arrogance of people to think that we human beings would be able to change what he is doing in the climate is outrageous. From my own state of Texas, climate change is not a science, it's a religion. And Lindsey Graham tells us why. The problem was Al Gore, he's the one who did it. He turned it into a religion. The internet has the answer to everything, and if you Google the internet, you will see proof of that statement. And if you look very carefully, you will see that somebody actually took the time to Photoshop my head onto the choir. <laughs> What is the reality? The reality is, is that if we read what the Bible actually says, it says in chapter one of book one of the Bible, that God made humans in his image for a reason. What was that reason? To be responsible for every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. 
This is where the concept of stewardship comes from. The idea that if somebody who you love more than anyone in the world gives you an incredibly valued piece of property and you extract every penny of value from that property and you leave it a smoking ruin, what does it say for how you really feel about that person? Whereas if they give you that land and you till it, you care for it, it's prosperous, it grows food, it supplies jobs for people, it has habitat. This is where the idea of creation care or earth keeping or stewardship comes from. But even this is incomplete because we are living things too. And when you look at where people live in poverty in this world, the darker brown the color, the more people live in poverty in these areas, when you look at where people live in poverty and you correlate that with where people are most vulnerable to the impacts of a changing climate, it is pretty much exactly the same. So if we really take the Bible seriously, Catholic or Protestant, we should be at the front of the line demanding climate action because our own principles and our own values are not just consistent with it, it actually calls us to be the leaders and be the advocates on this issue. Now, everybody's heard of the Pope's encyclical, probably. The Pope had an encyclical back in 2015 that was all about climate change. And in that encyclical, he connected the dots clearly between the impacts on poverty, injustice, and a changing climate. A lot of people don't realize, though, that four years before the encyclical, the National Association of Evangelicals in the United States released a similar report. It was called Loving the Least of These, and it also directly connected the dots between poverty, injustice, and climate impacts. So now you might say, well, okay, telling people more sciencey facts might not change their minds, but surely the Pope and the National Association of Evangelicals would have changed people's minds, right? I have a colleague who studied the effect of the Pope's encyclical on public opinion in the United States. Here's what she found. She found that if Christians in the US, whether Protestant or Catholic, already agreed with the Pope about climate change before the encyclical came out, then their opinion of the Pope went up. But she found that if Protestants or Catholics disagreed with the Pope about climate change before the encyclical came out, then after it came out, you know what happened? Their opinion on climate change did not budge, but their opinion of the Pope went down. So that's why these, re these objections are not even religious either. In Texas, they like to print their version of the Bible on road signs. Sometimes that can be a bit problematic, but I actually do like this one. That love thy neighbor thing, I meant it, signed God. <laughs> then, finally, there's a few more good ones. You can Google them if you want. Finally, there's the economic -y arguments. And I got this screen capture from CNN that was too perfect. You may think it is Photoshopped, it is not. I do not want to destroy the economy over climate change, says a senator from Florida. Well, the headline under his face says, a million homes in Florida are at imminent risk from sea level rise. And do you remember the senator who said, I'm using the same picture so you can remember who he was. Do you remember he said the arrogance of humans to think that we can interfere with what God is doing? He said, do you realize I was, and this was the same year, he said this the same year, do you realize I was actually on your side when I first chaired that committee and I heard about it? I was on your side till when? Till I opened the Bible? No. I was on your side until I found out how much it would cost. But let's just be clear. Even for the United States, which is one of the most fossil fuel dependent countries in the world, even for the United States, according to the 1600 page report that we wrote, don't worry, this is the only slide from it. According to that report, we found that at the very, very, very most, the cost of the US meeting the Paris Agreement targets would 
even out with the avoided impacts over at the most 20 years and likely quite a bit less than that. So what costs was this senator talking about? Well, if you go to Wikipedia and you look for the richest corporations in the world, this is the list that you get. Now, let's just cast our eyes, first of all, to number one and number 11 first. Number one is Walmart. Number 11 is Apple. Walmart is planning to be 50% clean energy by 2025, which is in five years. Apple is already 100% clean energy, and it is decarbonizing its entire supply chain. So far, so good. Obviously, they don't think it's too expensive. Let's go back here. Let's look at numbers 2 through 10. What companies are these? Oil and gas, oil and gas, oil and gas. Electricity, oil and gas, oil and gas, oil and gas. Automotive, automotive. Companies that made all of their money through digging up, processing, selling, or making things that burn fossil fuels. So he is right in a way. He is right in a way because it will cost who? It will cost the richest corporations in the world. That's who it will cost. And when you look at the politicians in the United States and in Canada too, who adamantly oppose climate action and you look at their funding sources and their partners and their supporters, there's not even one degree of separation between their position on climate action and their connection to entities on this list. But the reality, of course, is that climate change most affects the poorest in the world. And since the 1960s, some of my colleagues at Stanford just calculated this past year, since the 1960s, climate change has decreased the economic wealth of people in the poorest countries by 17 to 30 percent. And these are people who live off one or two pounds a day. Their wealth has already decreased by up to 30 percent, and it has increased the gap between the economic output of the world's richest and poorest countries by 25 percent. So what do we do then? If we don't engage with the science-y, religious -y, or economic -y sounding arguments, other than to simply say, no, that is not true, what is step two? Step two is to address the real problems, and the real problems have nothing to do with either science or theology. They have everything to do with tribalism and polarization, psychological distance, and solution aversion. Now these are technical terms, so let me explain each one of them. First of all, tribalism. The first most dangerous myth that we have bought into is that only certain types of people care about this issue. Like who? Greens, tree huggers, hippies, eco-nuts. That was a Google definition, literally, of an environmentalist. Eco-nut is apparently a synonym for it. I spoke earlier to a group of students, and we, we dug a little deeper into environmentalists. And out of curiosity, before my talk, I had Googled images of environmentalists. You know, if you Google a word, Google will show you, you know, pictures of people who are environmentalists. So I Googled environmentalists. Eight pictures popped up. Of those eight pictures, all of them were people who are well known for speaking out about the environment. So they were specifically that. They weren't anything else. Four out of eight had enormous beards. One out of eight was a woman. Six out of eight were dead. And eight out of eight were white. So we have this stereotype of, I have to be a, uh, a white dead man with a very large beard. <laughs> or a tree hugger to care about climate change. And I'm not, so I don't. But just think about this for a minute. We are not able to float around in outer space. We need the resources of this planet no matter where we fall in the political spectrum. Where do we get the air that we breathe? Where do we get the water we drink, the food we eat, the materials we use to make the chair you are sitting in, the clothes you are wearing, the materials that make up your phone, your computer, your vehicle, your home, Everything we use comes from this planet. 
The truth is that to care about a changing climate, we only have to be one thing, and most of us are this one thing, a human living on planet Earth. Hopefully all of us are that, but there's a few people you may be in doubt about. I said that once to someone, they said, yeah, I actually do want to go to Mars. So I said, okay, you're off the list then. <laughs> but everybody else is on this list. We live here. What's psychological distance? Psychological distance is the idea that climate change only matters to future generations, not us today, or to people or animals or plants that live far away, like low-lying islands in the South Pacific, but not here, or even the psychological distance of it's not relevant to me. So it affects things that are relevant to those people, but not things that are relevant to me. I'm just trying to put food on the table, trying to make sure there's clean clothes in the morning for the kids, uh, making sure that I have enough money to buy Christmas presents. It's not relevant to me. And we see this in the data. I'm going to show you some very detailed data from the US, which is a country where you have this data, but it's really applicable across almost anywhere I've talked to people. This map, which shows people's opinions by county, asks, do you think global warming is happening? And you can see most counties are orange, indicating yes. And the darker orange the color, the higher the number, over 50%. Blue is under 50% and orange is above 50%. Do you think global warming will harm plants and animals? Apparently, even if you don't think it's happening, you think it will harm plants and animals. This one's slightly orangier. Do you think it will harm future generations? Okay, so two-thirds of people think it will harm future generations, plants, and animals. So where's the problem? Do you think it will harm people who live in faraway countries? There's a little bit more blue, but it's mostly orange. Do you think it will harm people who live in this country? And then there's one more question they asked. Do you think it will affect you? So somehow we think it will affect our neighbors, but not us. The truth, of course, is that climate change is already affecting us here and now. And in fact, this is a colleague of mine from my university, his name is Chris Chu. He has actually found that by bringing the impacts home and by talking specifically about what is happening in Belfast with sea level rise, with flooding, with summer heat and drought, by talking about what is happening where we live and how it is affecting people we know, like farmers, like people's homes, you, we can actually reduce the tribalism too. So not only are we reducing the psychological distance by bringing it home, we can even reduce the tribalism by bringing it home. Because living in the same place connects us a little more closely to each other and overcomes some of the barriers we put up to say that that person is other, it's not, they're not part of our tribe. But then the third most dangerous myth is this one. The fact that we think the only viable solutions are bad. They will make our life worse, not better. They are harmful. They will destroy the economy. They will lead to socialism or communism or the antichrist and the beast. And I'm really not joking. I receive regular emails stating this. I have even heard recently in the US this past year, and at the first time I heard it, I thought, oh, they, they can't be serious. But then I heard this from the dean of a Christian university I was going to speak at. The, the faculty member who had invited me forwarded me an email from his dean. And in the email, the dean said, how dare you invite this woman to our campus? Because don't you know that the only solution to climate change is abortion? If you just kill all the babies, that'll fix climate change. And you know, as a Christian university, we are morally opposed to abortion, so how dare you bring somebody here on campus to speak about that? I was a little horrified. I don't think I've ever mentioned that word in any of my talks that I've given. But that was what he had heard, that the impacts were, or so that the solutions were so negative that the only solution was something that was absolutely morally abhorrent to his values. What do climate solutions really look like? Climate solutions can really look pretty good, like the Museum of Coal Mining in Kentucky putting solar panels on the roof, or United Airlines flying biofuel flights out of the LA airport these days, 
or in Texas, where we have the first carbon neutral airport in North America. We have the biggest army base in the US that runs off solar and wind. We have the fastest growing jobs. We have entire cities that are carbon neutral. We'll talk a little bit more about solutions, but solutions can look pretty good. And in fact, one of my favorite cartoons is this. I don't know if you've seen this before, but what if climate change is a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? Did you know that one in six deaths around the entire world is the result of pollution? And not all, but a significant proportion of that pollution of our air, our water, and our soil comes from fossil fuels. In the US, 200,000 people die from air pollution every year, most of those living in poor neighborhoods. In the Republic of Ireland, 1,200 people die from air pollution every year. I'm not sure what the numbers are in the UK, but they're similar. And these are developed rich countries, the poorer countries. This past year, you probably saw the headlines, Delhi turned into a gas chamber due to air pollution from fossil fuels. The truth is that there are positive beneficial solutions from across the political spectrum. So if we're not to engage with the smoke screens, if we are to tackle the real problems, what is step three? Step three is this, talk about it. We need to talk about the fact that we have more in common than what divides us. By bonding, we can overcome the tribalism problem. We need to talk about how the impacts of climate change are no longer distant and far off. They are right here at home. And by talking about that, we address the psychological distance. And finally, and honestly, perhaps most importantly, I think, if I had to just skip to, you know, if I only have 30 seconds, I'll skip to number three right away. We need to talk about positive beneficial solutions to address solution aversion. Now you may say, talk about it. That's all she's going to tell me to do. Well, you know what? I actually think that talking about it might be the most important thing that we do. Recent research just this year, published in June, showed that when we talk about it with friends and family, so they're not talking about scientists going out and talking about it, they're talking about individual people having conversations with friends and family, it leads people to know more, more information, like how it affects us where we live. It increases our acceptance of the problem as well as our concern about it. And guess what? Climate conversations enter people into a true pro positive feedback loop, where the more we talk about it, the more we know, the more we know, the more concerned we are, the more concerned we are, the more we talk about it. And here's the connection. If we don't talk about something, why would we care? And if we don't care, why would we ever act? Now you might say, still, talking about it doesn't sound like much. I was expecting you to tell everybody to stop flying, go vegan, don't have any more children, go live off the grid, but even if every single one of us in rich countries did that as individuals, it would only address a tiny fraction of the problem. The most important thing we can do is use our voice to advocate for change. And let me give you just one example. Two and a half years ago, a young 15-year-old autistic student took a piece of white cardboard and painted some words on it. And then she went and sat outside a building. That was it. Yes, she doesn't eat much meat. Yes, she doesn't fly. But imagine if she had gone 100% carbon neutral in her personal life, but had never done anything else. Nobody would know her name. But today, everybody knows her name because she used her voice. And of course, her name is Greta. Exactly. Who's the best messenger? You may say, oh, you know, I'm not a scientist. You know, maybe I could take the recording of this talk and you're welcome to do that. But the social science tells us also that the number one best messenger on climate change is you. To be specific, we trust our peers who share our values and speak a common language. The more we trust each other, the more concerned we are. And people say that friends and family are capable of persuading them to change their mind. In fact, they did a study where they educated middle school children, so ages 10 to 12. They educated children on climate change, but they measured the parents' opinions. This was done in North Carolina, and you know what happened? The opinions of the parents changed. 
And in fact, the most conservative parents changed the most. Daughters were actually most effective at changing their conservative dads' minds. So how do we have these conversations? We don't have these conversations by starting with the science and ending with a yelling match. Instead, we begin our conversations with what? What's step one? Bond. Bonding over shared values, over concerns that we genuinely share. So our tribalism and our politics does not immediately drive us apart. Number two, connect. Connect the dots between how climate change affects something that we both care about to address psychological distance. And number three, inspire each other with positive practical solutions we can engage in that are compatible with our values. Now, let me give you a few examples of each one of these. What can we bond over? The place we live, our family, a shared faith, an activity we enjoy, being members of the same club. I have bonded with people who I was head to head with on climate change over knitting. And we had a fantastic conversation, we connected the dots, and we ended up in agreement about solutions. Might not still be in total agreement about the science, but frankly, if we're in agreement about the solutions, that's all that matters. I had a, um, a NASA postdoc come up to me at a talk a little while ago, and he said, well, how do I connect with people? And I said, well, what do you enjoy doing? And he said, well, I really enjoy cooking with my family and my friends. I said, well, there you go. Talk about food. Talk about how climate change is decreasing the nutrient quality of our food, how it's causing food shortages in poor countries, how our beer and our chocolate and our coffee are being affected. You can immediately connect the dots. People say, well, you know, I come from a family that fishes and hunts. Oh my goodness, of course you can connect the dots there because our natural populations of birds and fish and animals are being affected by a changing climate. Now, because this is a theological lecture, I want to talk very specifically about our Christian faith. Caring about a changing climate is not somehow opposed to who we are. In fact, it is integral to who we are because we are told that we are to be recognized by our love for each other. We are to walk in love just as we have already been loved. Is it loving to reject the responsibility that we've been given to care for every living thing on this planet? Is it loving to bury our heads in the sand and saying that I don't care that the poorest and most vulnerable people in the world are being affected by it? No. The loving thing is to take that responsibility and to take that stewardship and to take that love of other people. And to do so, furthermore, not out of fear. This is the other place where our faith comes in. When we talk about climate change so often, we hear fear, right? Fear that the world will end in an apocalyptic disaster. Fear that our economical system will collapse if we do fix climate change. We hear fear in almost every headline we read about climate change. But as Christians, we are actually told that God has not given us a spirit of fear. So if we are reacting to fear, we are not reacting as who we are. Instead, as it says in the book of Timothy, we have been given power, which means that we're able to act instead of being paralyzed, which fear does. We have been given love to put others' needs before our own. And as a scientist, my favorite, we've been given a sound mind to make good decisions based on facts and data and reality, rather than tribalism, political positions, and fear. This is who we are. So as Christians, as humans on this planet, whatever our religious or faith affiliation or lack thereof, I truly believe that we can act lovingly by helping people get the energy that they need, that we've enjoyed for so many centuries, but to do so in healthy ways that do not pollute their air and their water or make poor countries indebted to the rich companies that have, or the rich countries that have the fossil fuels. By developing smart agriculture programs, smart food programs, by acting comprehensively. I don't know if you're familiar with Project Drawdown, but it's a fantastic resource that has a hundred different solutions to climate change. And sure, they have the wind turbines and they have the solar panels, but they also have biochar, where you burn agricultural waste at high temperature, you plow it back into the soil, it is an incredible natural fertilizer and it puts the carbon back in the soil where you want it instead of the atmosphere where you don't. Clean cook stove programs, so people no longer have to burn brush or dung inside, which is the second biggest contributor to deaths from pollution after fossil fuels. 
education of women and girls is actually a huge way to help. And this is one of my favorites and probably the biggest surprise. Number three on their list is reducing food waste. Did you know that we throw out over 30% of the food that we produce? And that organic material decays producing heat trapping gases? So reducing food waste is something that all of us can do. And reducing food waste helps provide more for others. So acting out of love for others, acting comprehensively to address this issue, acting in community together as some churches are through reducing their carbon footprint, through reaching out to the vulnerable in their community, through looking for ways to provide resources for those in need, including offering their roofs as solar gardens for the community. Acting in community is part of who we are. So if anybody says to you, what can I do about climate change? I have one answer for them, and this is my TED Talk. This was not my TED Talk. So if you want more examples of how to have conversations, that's my TED Talk. And in it, I talk about how we can bond with people, how we can connect the dots to climate change, and how we can together inspire each other as individuals, as families, as communities, as organizations, as cities and counties, and even as countries, to work together to fix this thing. Because the bottom line, again, is when it all comes down to it, our values are 100% compatible and consistent with fixing climate change. Because we all want a better future, and there's no way to get that unless we fix this problem. Thank you.